Welcome to today's episode of Marketing Innovators Podcast. Today we have Xavier Mizrobian, who is the VP of Sales and Marketing at Skynet Cloud Systems. Uh, with over 25 years of experience in sales and marketing, Xavier is a seasoned technical sales and marketing executive with a strong foundation on net new business development. Working with enterprise customers, OEMs, and reseller channels, Xavier identifies new opportunities and partnerships. He also identifies market needs and brings to market solutions that help customers enhance their business. Xavier, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Mudeep. How are you today? I'm doing very well, and I'm actually really excited about today's interview because I love the company name, Skynet Cloud Systems. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the company? So um, a little bit about me. So I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing here at Skynet. So Skynet actually is two companies. Uh, we are Skynet Cloud Systems is our parent or holding company, but we also um, own a f uh, subsidiary called Cogent Real-Time Systems. And in fact, the basis of the company has really been around Cogent Real-Time Systems. Uh, Skynet was created um, as a way to differentiate our cloud initiatives from our on-premise initiatives. Uh, so I manage sales and marketing, which covers uh, sales and marketing. We cover 86 countries. Uh, we have a uh, little over 20,000 implementations worldwide as a company. Wow, that is amazing. Um, so I understand that 99% of your business is outside of Canada. Is that correct? That is correct. In fact, um, all our development is in-house. Uh, all our sales marketing is in-house. Uh, but um, that is in Canada. But, uh, you know, we do business in 86 countries through distributors, through OEMs, agreements, um, through channel sales. So we go through a set of distributors and or systems integrators. Great. Well, I mean, we'll definitely go into more details about how you actually manage the marketing when it comes to, um, you know, working with so many different countries and uh, obviously with different time zones and different challenges that you experience. But let's get into your backstory a little bit. How did you actually end up, you know, in this role and, and what made you start Skynet Cloud Systems? So, so I was hired by Skynet uh, pretty much about seven years ago. Um, and uh, so, you know, my backstory is uh, really, I started as an account executive in ER, you know, automotive ERP systems in my early part of my career. Uh, went from that to technical sales consultant to product marketing manager. That was kind of my first career. My second career was in sales. And really, it's been on focus on business development, um, how to drive business into an organization. Um, I took this role as Skynet with Skynet uh, seven years ago um, and with the goal of driving our products into new markets and into new channels. Um, and it's been a very successful trip, actually. It's been a lot of fun, too. That's, That's great. great. So, so uh, when, when it comes to the marketing side, uh, you know, obviously when you're dealing with, uh, you know, sales and, and, and marketing in your, in your role, what kind of challenges are you experiencing right now, considering that you are marketing to so many different countries? So, you know, the, some of the challenges that we run into are language, time zones. Um, you know, those are kind of the big ones from a marketing perspective. Um, if we take a step back and we think about marketing for a second, though, um, marketing, whether I'm marketing in um, China or whether I'm marketing in Europe, um, what's consistent in all of our marketing are things like our brand. And so, with all marketing, you are in fact, you know, marketing your brand as well as your product. And so your product might include, you know, trademarks, um, your brand is your company. I mean, think of salesforce.com. You know, when people say we use Salesforce, they don't say salesforce.com, they say we use Salesforce. The same applies with, you know, most companies in marketing. So the challenge is making sure that you have a name and trademarks that, um, you know, don't uh, denote negative connotation in the language in which you're marketing to. Um, that's a really important thing. And so, you know, when you start from the beginning, you say, well, OK, so Skynet, what does that mean? Well, Skynet has to have some meaning. And the interesting part is, is we do get a lot of, you know, challenges when it comes to the name. 
but um, people do recognize the name quite well. Well, definitely. I mean, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, is Terminator. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and it comes to mind to many people. But the truth is, is that, you know, Skynet is really Sky and then Net, which is where we used a, a different approach to adding a double K. But the truth is, is it's a it's a network. If you think about it, that was our goal was to create this concept of an, a network that what our system does is create this secure network for industrial automation. Hmm. So just to be clear, is global domination one of the initiatives of Skynet? Absolutely not. <laughs> All right. Absolutely not. Just wanted to get that out there. So. Absolutely. <laughs> So Xavier, when it comes to marketing, you know, obviously when you're marketing to different countries, um, what, what kind of challenges are you currently experiencing and what kind of marketing has worked well for your brand? And so if you're looking at marketing, you actually have to take a step back and look at, you know, what it is that you're trying to market. Um, so the first one is your brand. You're marketing your brand, um, regardless of what, what you're doing. And, you know, that brand might include, will include your trademarks, will include a whole bunch of things. Um, but as you're marketing, um, the evolution of marketing has changed. And so over the years, um, you know, when we go back 10 years, you know, we would say, look, when we talk about marketing, we talked about marketing in terms of trade shows and newsletters and email marketing and traditional uh, advertising and digital advertising, which includes your S search engine optimization, your search engine marketing, your banner ads, and then cross selling. And so that whole, that whole timeline has shifted. 10 years ago, trade shows played a huge, um, a, a, had a huge you know, impact on your marketing initiatives. Today, with COVID, trade shows don't exist anymore outside of digital trade shows. And so at a traditional trade show, you'd have people at a booth, they're promoting their products, you're driving people into your booth. In a digital world, you have three seconds. So an elevator pitch for three seconds is hard to do. You have to drive the people into your digital booth, which is significantly harder than a traditional booth. Because as somebody's walking by your booth, you drag them in. You can't do that in digital marketing. So what has worked well for us is our ability to actually adapt to the changing needs of the marketplace. And so it's no longer a single marketing approach. It's a multi-channel approach um, where you, you know, you, you have a very organized um, approach to marketing, which includes your traditional advertising, your digital advertising, cross-selling, banner ads, email marketing, and newsletters. Trade shows are digital. So, are they that important to you? Nah, not really as much as they are from a brand perspective. Um, if you're going to go a digital, if you're going to go to a digital trade show, you want your name everywhere, and so that requires a big investment. Um, we look at marketing here at Skynet as a numbers game, and that numbers game is pretty simple. What is the cost per lead? Um, and if I'm, you know, if I'm doing search engine marketing, um, you know, I might generate a million, um, you know, views, but what is my actual cost for a customer to sign up or give me their information? What is the true cost? And so from that perspective, that's how we look at it. Um, you know, there has to be a benefit to us. And so we found that using all as many mediums as we can in a concise way drives a higher or, or a lower cost per lead, if that makes mm. sense. This is uh, really interesting. Uh, obviously, you're using many different channels uh, in, in terms of marketing, and uh, you've experimented with a, quite a few different uh, uh, strategies when it comes to marketing as well. Have you noticed certain marketing that works better for your brand than others when it comes to uh, uh, the cost per lead? Um, yes, we have. Um, and we would tell you, I would tell you that uh, the lowest cost per lead is the one that is focused on your customer. So one of the things that we have done and we do every year is to step back. Um, and who is our customer? 
Um, what are their problems? Uh, what is it we solve in their problems? And that changes over time. And so by stepping back and understanding who your end customer is um, and the problems, if you can reach them as opposed to reaching the global world, then we find that that has a much higher or lower cost per lead for us. So as an example, and, and so let me give you an example. If I'm working, I'm trying to market to a systems integrator. Um, I want to be everywhere where that system integrator is. So I want to be on the web pages that he looks at. I want to be in his face. So I need to be in the publications that are in his face, basically. So when you're actually targeting that customer, uh, obviously it's not just one channel of marketing that, you, that you, you're utilizing, you're obviously utilizing other channels as well. How do you track all that information? Because you're using a variety of marketing techniques and uh, you know, when it comes to the customer journey and try to identify what that cost per lead is, where do you actually gather those metrics and, and how do you track that information? Yeah, so that's a really good question because that's one of the big challenges in marketing is information. Um, and so uh, one of the big, the big challenges is, is that you, you know, as the old saying goes, don't trust anyone in marketing um, unless you can capture the data yourself. And so um, one of the key things that uh, we do is we do use a marketing automation system here in-house. Um, we are a Salesforce house. So from that perspective, uh, we've, you know, we're integrated with Pardot. We're sending our emails through Pardot. We're doing our tracking through Pardot. Um, we have our tracking, our campaigns set up in Salesforce. Um, any traditional advertising, we have landing pages. So we can track, um, we can actually track all of our, uh, the effectiveness of all of our advertising. All of the advertising sources will generate some reports for you, but they're non-integrated. And so from that perspective, having the integrated view of our data provides us the ability to capture or calculate what our cost per lead is based on the campaigns that we create. And so each one of the campaigns that we create, we have a cost, uh, we have a, a, a click-through rate, if you will, and then we can bring that right up to a physical sale. So when it comes to obviously marketing to different countries, um, do you find that uh, a platform such as Pardot can be effective, uh, you know, dealing with different time zones and dealing with different language barriers? How do, how do you overcome that challenge? So no our marketing automation system is perfect. I, I'm, I'm just going to preface it as that way. Um, they all have their challenges. Um, and so, um, you know, have I found one yet that is able to solve all of our challenges? No. Have I had to have workarounds for all of them? Yes. Uh, as a good example, Pardo can't generate uh, mailers based on time zone. Um, if I set a mailer out for seven o'clock in the morning, it assumes that it's going to be my seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and so when you're talking about time zones in, you know, Japan, <clears throat> in Japan, seven o'clock in the morning is at night. Uh, so likelihood that they're going to read it is pretty low. It, the idea is, is that you have to work with the systems that you have. Language issues. Um, one of the great things about our technology is that uh, technology is in English. So the good part is most of the people we're marketing to are English speaking um, and where they're not, then we do set up separate mailers for their country. So IE will set up a mailer in France or we'll set up a mailer if we need to in Germany. But for instance, Germany is their second language is English. So usually that works. Hmm. So when it comes to Obviously, the lead acquisition, that's uh, you have to really align your messaging with the customer journey. But then there's also the customer retention and there's uh, marketing automation platforms that are used to nurture prospects and, and customers once they've actually become a, uh, become a client um, to uh, upsell business. Do you currently utilize certain strategies to do that uh, from uh, Pardo as well? Or is it uh, 
a different approach that you take? It's a different approach. Um, because uh, we mark, because we're in industrial automation and we're a very niche player within industrial automation, um, what, you know, our customers are, you know, as an example, they will purchase our software, they will put it in a wind farm um, and that wind farm will be running. They won't touch the software, they won't touch the wind farm for years. And then one day, you know, they're going to upgrade the software or upgrade the hardware, which means they upgrade the software. Um, we, our approach is one where we're constantly touching our customer um, and advising them of what's new with their applications or what's new with the product or here's a new release. Um, we're advising them on case studies, use cases, keeping our name in front of them. Um, and obviously we're trying to upsell them in an indirect way. Um, but chances are they're not going to be changing the wind farm. They, they would never send an engineer out to a wind tower unless it fails. <clears throat> so from that perspective, being a niche player, we have to have a different approach. Uh, nurturing systems, um, you know, whether it's Pardo or Maketo or whoever, the nurturing systems, um, they don't have the information they need if that makes sense. Um, most, you know, you need to have a system that's completely integrated to your website. If you're marketing through your website to know when that customer needs to get a certain piece of content. Um, and so your website has to be augmented or segregated in such a way that you can generate marketing from specific page landings or landing pages on your website. Very few systems can do that um, from that perspective. Some can, uh, but the ones that can also don't have a way of controlling how many emails a prospect will get. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where I can put in this marketing automation in place, but I'm bombarding my customer with so many emails, he's going to pull me off the list. And the minute that happens, then I really can't reach out to the customer anymore. As GDPR, once a customer says, I don't want to be contacted anymore, I have to take that off my list. That's the rule. Hmm. So it's a very fine line as to how much content you need to be delivering. And obviously, depending on who you're dealing with, you know, some wouldn't mind receiving a whole ton of email, especially if they're a customer of yours, but others would would kind of, would find it quite intrusive. How do you manage the balance in that in that area? Because you know you have to really, I would say, personalize your approach to your clients. So um, let me give you a great example. Um, on a daily basis, I probably get four hundred emails. Um, my system, I have defined my email system such that um, if the email is sent to me directly then from an individual, it gets to my mailbox. If I'm CC'd, it never gets into my mailbox. It goes into a different mailbox. If it's generated from a marketing automation system, so there's cross-linking or, you know, that the system can identify, it just goes straight into spam. <laughs> and so my 400 emails no longer become 400 emails. They're about, you know, maybe 100, which is, or something, which is something I can manage easily. And then when I have time, I deal with the CCs. My customers aren't that different. And so if I'm going to send them a message, it should have some value. Um, it should be something that they want to hear. They don't want to hear a sales pitch. They want something that, they, that will grab their attention. Remember in email, we have three seconds. The rule is three seconds. And in fact, most emails are read on a phone before they're actually ever read on a desktop. And so in reality, if you look at your iPhone, your Android device, um, they're looking at the first two lines. And most automation systems, the first line is the title of the email. The second line is some image link that makes no sense. So you want, the email that gets to their phone to be as clear and concise that makes them want to open up. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, you know, the proof is in the, in the data because uh, data doesn't lie. 
And as you were mentioning earlier, that you want to be tracking everything so you can make those strategic decisions better and uh, and ultimately be more effective in your in your campaign. So because you have this complete customer timeline and their journey mapped out um, and uh, the data coming into a system like Pardo, um, it allows you to make those intelligent decisions moving forward when it comes to email marketing, when it comes to, you know, sending out these messages. Uh, but what I struggle with to know also is that because so many different countries have different rules and regulations when it comes to email marketing specifically, uh, it must be quite a bit of a challenge to navigate that landscape, uh, trying to abide by all these different policies that you have to face. It is. But um, so we took a position as a company that we we're going to follow GDPR. And so um, regardless of what country they're in, a GDPR is the standard and the most restrictive when it comes to email marketing and or marketing as general. And so we have we follow GDPR, period. Um, and the advantage of that is that I don't need to follow the rules of Castle or the U.S. rules. Um, if I follow GDPR, they all fall into the same category. And so um, there are some benefits to having one uh, approach, um, and it's easier to implement. Uh, the disadvantage is that, um, you know, because internally we follow GDPR, it means that if somebody says, I don't want to receive any mail, um, I don't send them any mail. And if they're in the US, it's business to business. And in theory, I could just keep firing them emails. Um, totally different rules, but yet we'll follow the most stringent um, so that we're never fined um, and we never piss off our customer. Truthfully, that's what it's all about, right? So people buy from people. They don't buy from companies. Um, they buy a product. And so the last thing you want to have is a conversation with somebody getting mad at you because you sent them an email that they didn't want. That's true. That's true. Um, when it comes to uh, marketing to different countries, obviously uh, you do lose out a little bit, but I think following the standard of GDPR um, puts you um, along. It, it basically makes sure that you're following the guidelines of other countries as well. So that's great. Uh, with regards to where you see your business venture moving forward. What is what is the future of, of Skynet over the next uh, decade or so? So we're a public company and I can't share with you where our future is going. Um, uh, but I can share with you where I think industrial automation is going. And, um, you know, it's the best way that I can put it is I, I, I need to, you know, put your, your audience needs to sit back and think about what CRM systems were like 15 years ago. And 15 years ago, um, you know, everybody had their in-house CRM system, everybody was in-house. And then all of a sudden this one company out of California said, no more computers, no more software, it should be all cloud-based. And the industry said, hey, you know what? You know, that's never gonna happen. And all of a sudden that company has now become the standard in CRM software that everyone chased for years. Um, the cloud is going to change everything and industrial automation is really going to move to the cloud. Um, now that doesn't mean that we're not going to have manufacturing and we're going to have manufacturing systems in place, but there is a huge, um, market swell to move data to the cloud. And so you're starting to see more and more large companies wanting to um, collect their data, bring it into a cloud platform, run analytics, bring those analytics back down into the into the manufacturing floor, um, where alarms are being generated in the cloud and no longer on the on the base floor. There is, um, you know, we're getting to this point, and I think COVID really helped because it made people realize how susceptible they are if they can't work in the office. And so that is really, I think, started to push the industry in that direction. So you just have to kind of look at what's, what the industry is looking at. So you take a look at you know, the, the big players out there, the, the Honeywell, the Siemens, the Yokogawas, everyone in that industrial automation space, 
And you see that they all have these cloud initiatives. They're all partnering with cloud companies. Um, they're not doing it for the benefit of themselves. They're doing it for the benefit of the clients. The clients are pushing them there. Um, there isn't actually a day that I don't go by where I'm talking to somebody who wants to get data to um, a cloud platform. And so as a company, um, as an innovative company, we have to take a seat um, and drive that innovation forward, and which is what we've done. So as a company, we recently released our you know, innovative platform for Azure. We have it running on AWS. We make it easy for customers to do what they want to do. Um, but I think the world is gonna move to the cloud. It's all gonna be cloud-based. So you are to, Skynet is uh, to industrial automation what Salesforce was to CRMs 15 years ago. I think industrial automation as a whole is what Salesforce was 15 years ago. And so it is moving now into the cloud. And it's not just us, it's everyone is moving to the cloud. Um, and companies that don't move that way, um, they'll be left behind. The, the truth is the cloud levels the playing field. And um, you know the best way I can put it is that prior to uh, CRMs being in the cloud, there were only a few of them out there. And today there are hundreds of CRM platforms in the cloud. It, lay, lay, it literally levels the playing field. And now, as opposed to using, as an example, um, as opposed to using um, an analytics program or a historian from uh, you know, Aviva, um, customers are using open source historians in the cloud, saving themselves hundreds of thousands of dollars a month by using open source. That has a dramatic impact on the business, right? So how are you going to be dealing with the competition that is going to be coming up here? And also, do you currently have direct competitors that, uh, that you find are, uh, are becoming um, you know, challenging in some ways? So everyone has competition, we have competition. There's no question about that. We differentiate ourselves from our competition. That's what we do. Um, and do we still have a competitive edge over our competition? Absolutely. Will we maintain that competitive edge in our competition? Absolutely. And we protect that with trademarks. We protect that with our patents. Um, those are the things that we do to protect our market space, if you will. Um, but we're also agnostic. So we're in a unique place. And that unique place is that we work with all automation providers. We're not restricted to being our own. Um, in fact, in many cases, you know, we'll work with, we will work with anyone and they will work with us. In fact, automation is in fact, a cooperative competitive environment, which is the competition can also become your customer. And that is not uncommon in this business. And so because we the, the foundations of automation are like that, moving to the cloud just increases our ability to sell more products because there's more people buying them. That's interesting. Um, so on a more of a personal note, um, Xavier, if you could go back to 10 years, what advice yep. would you give to your younger self? Uh, I, you know, I often, um, I often ask myself that question, strangely enough. And um, when, we st when I first started in the business, um, one of the challenges are is, you know, and I like to use it as you're full of piss and vinegar. You know you're going to do this, you're going to happen, you're going to make it happen. Um, and um, one of the things that I'm always reminded of is, and I say this to myself often when I talk to customers internally, and that is, is shut up and listen. And the reason is, is because we as salespeople or marketing, we like to talk. We like to tell people what they need without listening to our customers. Um, 
Any good salesperson will tell you that any sales call should represent 10% of you talking and 90% of your customer talking. And as a marketer, we have to listen to our customers. And so if I could say anything to myself 10 years ago, it would be just shut up and listen. Because the minute you know what your customer wants, you just have to articulate what they need and they will become your customer. It's that simple. It's not difficult and it's a simple tool. Just shut up and listen. <laughs> that is so true. Um, I was going to ask you about your, based on your experience and your challenges, what big marketing takeaway can you give to our listeners? But I think that would be it. Uh, but if you have anything else to share, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, mention what other advice can you provide to our listeners? I would say um, talk to your customer, talk to their customers, because in some cases, if you're an OEM, you're providing a piece of the puzzle. Understand what their problems are, truly understand them. Uh, because if you do understand their problems, then you can market to the problems. Um, the only other thing I would tell you is be fluid. Uh, marketing is changing and it is cha COVID has clearly shown us that the market shift um, is happening. And even as I sit in my office here today, um, where, you know, I've been in the office very few times this year, uh, I would tell you that the entire marketing has to adjust to where people are and how they can be reached. True. So where can people find out more about yourself and, uh, and contact you online? I'm an open book. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on our website. Uh, my emails are not hidden by any means or form. Uh, people are welcome to reach out to me directly. Uh, so uh, I would say if you can't find me, it's because you're not looking hard enough. But uh, go to skynet.com. You will see us. You will see me there in the management team. Um, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing some great insights here today, Xavier. It's been such a pleasure to uh, speak with you and to learn about uh, some of the initiatives you're working on and also learn about uh, you know, Sky Skynet uh, as well. And uh, we wish you the best.